you shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gifts there before the altar and go first to reconcile with your brother and sister and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Today, we're talking about Jesus' wisdom on anger. The reason I'm sure that it applies to you is that you're human. And to whatever degree you're aware, and to whatever degree you're not, you and I get angry. Sometimes we get angry quickly. We didn't see it coming, and then all of a sudden, there it is. And we have all kinds of instincts to act out in the anger. Sometimes we brew over. Sometimes it kind of builds up over time. Sometimes we get sick, physically sick, because we can't deal with the anger. And we know we'll end up in prison if we do what we have in mind. We really do have to deal with anger. And anger is a tool. People who can convince us to be angry at the people they're angry at and angry enough at the people they are angry at, we will follow them into war. We will do violence with them and for them. And in most cases in world history, leaders get us aren't the leaders angry enough to do the violence for them while they watch us make them rich. We are the victims of the anger in us, and the world is the victim of the anger between us. That's the truth. Y'all want to agree? It's the truth. Jesus is talking here, and he says, when you come to offer a sacrifice, and I put that out because it lets you know who he's talking to. These are the people who live somewhere other than Jerusalem, and they travel to Jerusalem because they're good Jewish people, and they offer offerings in Jerusalem. You don't offer offerings at synagogues, right? So everybody he's talking to are the people who, if they lived in Capernaum, would travel, walk, you know, no Uber there. You're going to walk to Jerusalem on the occasion that you're supposed to, and you offer your offering. Not only that, you're going to raise the animal, create, uh, brew the wine, make the wine, or raise the, the grain, or buy the grain, or buy the animal, or buy the wine that you need to make the offering right. So these people he's talking to are faithful people who are keeping the law and doing their good, do good deeds in God's eyes. Now, I like knowing that because sometimes I like to think of myself as that. Like, hey, at, as in a general rule, I get up every morning and I have my prayer time every morning and I generally commit sometime during that prayer time, Lord, help me, show me, guide me. Let's get on with this day. You 
You use George today, Lord, I belong to you. Some version of that somewhere or another. I write in my journal and we get committed. Well, I just want you to know sometimes, you know, I'm not saying it happens very often, but sometimes before the day's out, I'm angry at me. People that might live with me and that's only one person at the moment. So, and it, you know, and so you don't, you don't, you know, I don't get to walk around going, well, since I'm angry, I must have a right to be angry and let's just act on all this anger. Jesus comes to people like me and people like you because you're sitting here on the day of the Lord in the Lord's house. So he's talking to us. And he says to us, here's what I want you to learn about anger. Jesus, first off, my first point in the outline is Jesus calls us to something beyond the legal correctness of following the law. By the way, I've got a PDF of the 613 positive commands and negative prohibitions. I haven't shared them with you yet. But I'm going to do a class. I think it'll start in September or sometime. We're going to do a class. And we're going to look at Galatians. And, what, and Galatians says we're not obligated to the law. And when we do that, I'm going to hand you. And by the way, in a matter of seconds on the Internet, you can have your own list anytime you want. But I'm going to hand out a list of 613 positive commands and negative prohibitions that are in the Torah. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through the list and we're going to say, which ones of these do we now keep? And I just want to give you the heads up. It won't be many. There are things involving oxes that we don't do anymore. There are things involving enemies and that it's not our job anymore. And I just give you a heads up. But what Jesus is talking about is not, hey, let's do a good job at just following the law. He's talking to us about something far beyond the law. The law judged him to be a blasphemer. The law judged him to be an, an enemy of God. The law put Jesus on the cross. And we will get angry at Jesus and put him on the cross every time we refuse to see the radicalness of what he's asking. But it comes after, are we listening? Please listen. It comes after the radicalness of what he gives. You cannot live the radicalness of the love of Christ until you are embraced by and live in the radicalness of the love that Christ has for you and me. And that person you're mad at. That's the whole sermon, now the longer version. I believe that Jesus is talking about the relentless effort that God is making, and we are called to be a part of the relentless effort to help us experience the love of God and to help everyone else experience the love. Because Whatever degree in your own life, you and I have failed to experience the love of Christ from some people. Who were those people that didn't fully love you like Jesus? I don't know your story. I know mine. Turns out, when I sat with people who helped me think about my life in counseling sessions and prayer times on retreats, I found out that there's, there were a lot of times I wasn't loved like Christ, and a lot of times I didn't love like Christ. Can you believe it? My mama and my daddy weren't perfect. Hmm. Who knew? I knew. <laughs> and they didn't have a perfect son. Who knew? They knew. It's the relentless effort. In fact, Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I won't read it all, because I, we want to be done by noon. So to, and, and in terms of Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul it says something really radical. He says, I want to tell you how relentless I believe this effort is to reconcile the world to each other and to God, is that when I'm with a Jew, I act like a Jew. When I'm with people who don't keep the law, I act like a person who doesn't keep the law. I am all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. What? That is relentless action. He is so committed to people who ended up passing on the word and came to George Fuller. He was so relentless on the love of God being shown to Jews and non-Jews. The people who were making sincere efforts to keep the law and people who were not trying to keep the law at all. And then it came to George. And the, the message to George was, George, 
you're trying to do some things good, and there are some things you're just not paying attention to. George, I want you to know God loves you. God forgives you. I want you to know that. It's true. And you know how when your dad would get mad and he would get violent? He's not like God when that happens. That's not the way God does. And God might be mad at the same thing your dad's mad at, but God's anger re resides in love and compassion and is an anger against the self-mutilation and the self-guilt and the shame that we carry because God knows that it's the guilt and the shame and the, the self-loathing that causes us to sin. So Jesus is calling us to something far beyond the legal correctness. You understand when he said these thoughts, there were Pharisees going, what? That's more radical than us. We think we're really good at keeping the law. You're talking about something far beyond that. Now let's look at what that is. Notice that he says, you've heard it said, don't murder, but I tell you, anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, don't be even angry at your brother. Don't be angry. You can't help getting angry, but you can help staying and acting on your anger. You understand? You can. Please never feel guilty about the arrival of anger. Take responsibility for what you do next. Do not feel guilty about the arrival of anger. You had no choice about that. Become responsible for what you do next. Be responsible for who you are when you do the next thing and who helps you and guides you do the next thing. <clears throat> That's what we have to learn. <clears throat> Once our anger is acted on, he tells in this passage, once your, act, anchors act, act, your anger is acted on, you're going to suffer the consequences. He's not saying it should be this way, that, you know, all these bad consequences and ultimately hellfire. He's not saying that. He's saying it gets worse, it gets worse, it gets worse. If you act on your anger, there's consequences. And they can't be stopped sometimes. I know more than two dozen people in my lifetime who have ended up serving prison time because they lost their temper. And none of those people would have been predicted to have ended up in prison. What do you think? Can you see how it would happen? Can you see all the ways it could happen? But I've had people say a few times, George, what are you doing? That was totally uncalled for. Everybody ever had that said to you? <clears throat> what are you doing? That is totally uncalled for. That is an overreaction. Hmm. And what Jesus is saying in this passage is that <clears throat> when you start saying things out of anger and doing things out of anger, it, can, it starts a chain reaction that could end up in the worst thing possible. And some people hear that the fires of hell and think that ultimately you get cast into hell by God. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying is when you can imagine the worst it can be, the worst it can be is caused by us relentlessly with no restraint acting on our anger in relation to, to each other, and you will create hell if you act on your anger in relationship to each other. It'll be the worst it can be. <clears throat> and the way it works in our world, if there's law operating anywhere, you could, and your little tail, my dad would say it differently, would end up in prison. And I can remember my dad saying, George, the reason I'm, I'm disciplining you about that is that if you do that and you're 21, you go to prison. Oh, huh. <clears throat> if you say that to your boss, you get fired. But don't say it to me. Oh. <clears throat> Think about anger. First, anger comes when our values are violated. You see somebody doing something that offends your values. What you think is right and wrong, you get angry. Okay. We get angry when somebody's different than us. I don't know about y'all, but I've walked in the room and had some, some other style of music playing, and I was already angry. <clears throat> Maybe you're not that sensitive. I walk in there and think, I hate that stuff. And, it, and then I, I walk in, somebody, you know, I walk into a room, and there's people there that hadn't learned to speak the language I speak. Well, what in the world? Come on, people. I'm frustrated. And remember, 
I don't have any guilt for that feeling. I have a, I have to take responsibility for what comes next. So far, I have not said what came to mind when those things have occurred, and they've occurred many times in my life. In fact, I've ended up liking some music I didn't know how to appreciate, and I've ended up becoming friends with people who were learning my language because Jesus helped me. I don't know about y'all, but I need help with that because I can get angry. In fact, when I get angry at Tammy, that means it's possible for me to be angry at the person most committed to loving me of any person on the face of the earth. Right? It's been proven for 44 years. And I can still get angry. Isn't that crazy? No, it's actually normal. So don't go blaming me. Because I don't care how long you've been with somebody or love somebody. If you don't get angry at him, you're just not paying attention to what's going on in your head. Because that person will challenge you. In fact, that's probably their job. And also, when our, our territory gets invaded, we're angry, right? And it's surprising what I find is my territory. I was in a band, and we hired a guy to play lead guitar in my band. And he took over my riff on the guitar. It really made me angry. And you know what I had to do? I had to say, no, you back off. That's my riff play that riff and he's like whoa well i thought i was the lead guitar player well you are okay well then you play that riff because you're the i'm sorry i was wrong that is your riff to play i'm i'm singing sorry i was wrong but he messed with my character because i couldn't play 99 percent of the riffs he could play but that one riff he could play that i could play i wanted it to be mine We get angry when our territory gets left. And then we get angry, and then what we do is we label people. In fact, Jesus calls it raka and fool. And when we get to the point that we label somebody, ha, ah, then we're ready. We can do whatever we want when somebody has a label that, that is appropriate to be angry at. Then we can just, we use it to predict. A label predicts. I know what that person does because I've labeled them. And we've used it to dismiss. Oh, they're one of those, so I don't have to pay attention. I don't have to care what they think or how they're suffering, because they're one of those. Or we define people as friend or foe. We define people as in or out because we place a label on them. Jesus comes along and says, you've heard it said, it's okay to be angry at the people you label. And you've heard that people would say, raka, and you fool. But I'm telling you, here's how it is. When you do that, the minute you label and use a word to label somebody and dismiss them or to act in anger because of the label, you have left the kingdom of God and you are on your way to the fires of hell. Not eternal punishment. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about how bad it can get in our relationship with each other. It gets really bad once we label each other. So then it says, you are to work. Jesus is saying in this passage, you are to work in your heart and your relationships to deal with anger before you do harm with words and action. Before. What's that word? Oh, before. Just walk around all week every time you get angry. Before. Before. Why did you say before? Well, I was thinking about saying something to you, but before I do that, I was going to pause for before. Before that happens, before I say that, before I do that, I'm going to do what? Jesus asked us to do before we act in anger. Now I want to get to what I think is the crux of the matter in my experience. I think we think God's mad at us. I think we think God's angry at us. And we end up angry at ourselves. And we end up labeling ourselves as unworthy. And instead of sinner being the word for the person in grace who's opening up themselves to the reality of what they need to learn to do differently. Because sin and confession and transformation is good because we become aware and we can change accordingly. But if, if we buy the story that that disqualifies us, we have not let the cross accomplish its goal. 
the cross has said, no matter what you do, I still love you this much. When do I love you this much? Every minute of every day. No matter what you do, you're worth this. You're worthy. Whoever told you you weren't worthy? Maybe talking about you You did it again. Do y'all ever do it again? I would do it again. There you go. <clears throat> and then the people who are angry at us. What do we do with the people who are angry at us and who label us? Well, it's very tempting to not wear the label. Very tempting to react quickly without thinking, without loving. And then what about those we're angry at and those we're labeling? Have you known anybody? I've known several people who were required because of what they did in order to avoid prison time had to attend a class called anger management. And the idea is in anger management is here's what we want you to learn how to do before you do that thing again that's going to land your butt in prison. Here's what we'd like you to do. We're going to teach you skills. I wish Jesus could walk into those classes and get time. Say, let me give you a different philosophy. Instead of being motivated to do good just to save your own butt, why don't you do good to love yourself and everyone else? You've heard it said, love your neighbor, hate your enemies. I'm telling you, even when you're your own enemy, love yourself. Even when you think you're acting and may be acting as an enemy of God, understand God loves you. In that moment, God has loved you. Wow. Anger management could be restraint to avoid the consequences for me and for us. We're going to be, we're going to restrain ourselves because we don't want the consequences. But it could be we're restraining ourselves and we're going into our inner work of our heart and we're going to have conversations because we actually want our lives and our relationships to be guided by the love of Christ. Woo! You know what's possible when that happens? reconciliation between people who are really different, who really at are at odds when bad things have really been done. When I'm gone on September uh, the 4th, uh, I'm going to be gone that Sunday because there's two, two birthdays that weekend in Gastonia of my grandchildren. And they used to have one birthday party, but now the youngest one's old enough to have his own friends. So he wants his own party. So there's going to be two parties. So I'm going to, Tammy and I are going to go down. We're going to spend the weekend. There's going to be two birthday parties. And Scott Bass is going to be the preacher that day. And Scott Bass works with restorative justice. Can you imagine somebody who finds a way to help people talk through murder and robbery and violence and abuse and all the kinds of crimes and then be restored and the the victim and the victimizer are restored. The criminal and the victim of the crime are restored. Can you imagine? It? I'm telling you, there are people outside of Jesus Christ's love who can't. Now, you put them where they need to go. You, you, you take them to the judge, as Jesus said. Here's what happens when you're outside the love of Christ. It's exactly what Jesus said it would happen. You get taken before the judge, and they take you, and they put you in prison. And if it gets really bad, it gets the worst it could be, like the hellfire that is possible. That's what will happen. Well, this morning I came in, and I was sitting there, and all of a sudden I heard thunder. Did y'all hear any thunder this morning? Well, then thunder got kind of loud, then it was, whoo, and I was like, whoo, here we go. Well, I don't know about y'all, but I love watching a thunderstorm roll in. So I went out underneath the canopy over there, and I'm just like, why am I loving that thunderstorm? Because I don't think I'm in danger while the negative and the positive uh, charges get uh, neutralized. I don't think I'm in danger right then of the, of the winds that might come through a tornado and rip everything apart. Right then, I'm sitting there going, this is just nature doing nature's thing, and I'm not in danger. What if that was the way anger was for us? What if we went, oh, there's the anger, there's the anger. Hey, but I'm in Jesus. I'm not going to do that. I see the lightning. I hear the thunder. I feel the feeling of anger. That person does too, but that's not how we do it. We come in here under the canopy, and we work through it. No one gets 
hit dead by lightning and no one gets blown away by the wind. I sat there thinking, that'll preach. So it did. But what happens if you end up right in the middle of a storm and you're right where the negative and positive charges come together? Boom! What if you are right where? And I've been part of several teams that do recovery after hurricanes and tornadoes. And we went to the Red Springs tornado. I was shocked when we went around a curve. And as we went around the curve in this little valley, the tornado would come through and it looked like a clear cut all the way through the woods, just ripped trees up. And it, these trees not bothered at all on either side, but these are totally ripped up by the roots. That's what can happen if we're in the path of anger. So, as I conclude, let me say this. This is all what Jesus is talking about. It's all part of becoming God's people who live and love like God. I have several passages there at the end of the outline. I just want to sweep through them real quick. I'm not going to read them. I'm going to reference them. But you can look up each one of them because I want you to see that there are many words about this topic in Scripture. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 48, I didn't put the dash 48 in the bulletin. We see, you've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You've heard it say, love your friends, hate your enemies. I'm telling you, love your enemies. Wait a second. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 16, when you forgive sins, you are forgiven. When you don't forgive sins, you're not forgiven. You can't experience forgiveness when you don't forgive. And unless you know you're forgiven, you're not going to forgive other people. Where does it start? Some, for some people, it starts knowing you're forgiven, and then you become able to forgive. Or there are people that become, I can't forgive you, I can't, oh, I do need to forgive you, and I need to forgive myself. Which direction does it go? It's both. In fact, in Exodus chapter 21, verses 12 to 14, if you want to go back to the law, instead of going with the grace of Christ, and you go back to Exodus 21, verses 12 to 14, and it says, when you do act in anger and you kill somebody, you should be taken out, and put to death. I'm glad we're past. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. Paul says, and this, is, this could be the summer, be angry, but do not sin in your anger. Because when you sin in your anger, you're giving an opportunity for the devil. In other words, the worst scheming reality we can imagine is using you as a tool when you act in your anger. You are precisely at that moment the servant of the worst personification of evil you can imagine. Because you've unleashed life with no grace. And then finally, in 1 John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, John says, here's how we know that we have eternal life. We forgive each other. How do we know we're learning life differently and receiving life differently, that our life is in Christ and not in the world and in the values of the world and all the angry realities of the world? How do we know that? Well, look at, look at George. He forgives people. Of course he forgives Tammy. She loves him a lot. That's easy. But George actually sees people do things, and he's very upset, and he's very convinced it's wrong, and he's convinced they're, they're stubborn in their in their evil doing, and he has this idea of how to destroy it. In fact, that's why his favorite TV show, the old version of Equalizer, was my favorite show. I don't know if y'all remember it. There's a new one. I haven't watched it yet. I watched about 10 minutes, but I can't watch everything. But the old man of Equalizer, well, somebody would be doing bad and persisted in bad, and Equalizer would show up and say, you ain't going to do that anymore. And then the bad guy would say, yes, I am. And you know, it, 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 that's the way it works. And I'm just like, I understand that. I love watching that show. And you're like, well, why, George, would you love watching that show? Well, I'm just saying that if I didn't have Jesus, that's how it would go. And I'd probably end up dead. In fact, Jesus is saying, that's the way it works. It ends up in the hell fire. It ends up the worst you can imagine is everybody becomes equalized. You broke my law, pow. You broke my law, pow. I don't like that, pow. You don't like that, pow. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, this is what is said. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished by his teaching because he taught as one who had authority. 
and not as their scribes. You have what their scribes have, you won't forgive yourself, you won't forgive others, you won't stop labeling yourself, you won't stop labeling others because the scribes will teach you how. If you have Jesus and the grace of God, you will stop judging yourself and stop judging others, you'll stop labeling yourself and you'll stop loving others. And we will realize the truest thing about us and everyone we meet is that we are the beloved of God and that we are the ones who are in grace and learning to love better. And we become the people who learn to love better after we're angry. We're not the ones who get to never feel angry. Please don't beat yourself up for being angry. Please slow down and let Jesus bathe you in the love of God and teach you how to love beyond your anger, beyond my anger. Lord, I thank you so much for your love. Thank you for not condemning us for what we really can't avoid. We do run into ourselves and others in circumstances where anger erupts in us. But do help us, Lord, by your spirit to slow down and be reminded that if anything should have ever made anybody angry and ready to reject people completely, it would be a son being killed. But in reality, it is in that moment that we see that you are not a God who reacts in anger, but you are a God who receives us as we are and forgives us and fills us with your love and invites us to know and share that love with ourselves and with others. So help us to do that. In the name of Christ, we pray.